with all the guys you've worked with, all the gals, who's easier to get along with and, and put music together? Easier? Yeah. Well, you know, Steve Miller's one of my favorites, you know. I always uh, got, got along really good, and, and we just sort of gel really good, you know. And he's, he was really open to, to suggestions and, and things, you know. So Steve, Steve Miller's probably one of my favorite as far as the, you know, working with. And wasn't it the Steve Miller band where you got to play the Second Network Festival? That's exactly right. Yeah, we, we did. And, oh, and that's a, that's a funny story because I was down in L.A. cutting the bed tracks with Bob Skaggs for my first album for Columbia. And we just cut all the bed tracks and, and um, we we're taking a break. And I uh, went back up to my house in Novato, California at the time. And Miller was living just up the hill from me. You know, and, and he calls me and says, hey, Les. He goes, what are you doing next week? And I said, well, nothing. I'm just hanging out. He says, you want to go to London with me and play a gig? And I said, well, sure, Steve, let's go. <laughs> you know, so, so he said, well, come on up to the house. We're going to rehearse, you know. So, so I went up to this house, and, and it was, he, he, got to, he had Lonnie Turner on bass, which was his original bass player. And uh, we got Doug Clifford from Creedence Clearwater on drums. You know, great cats, man. And we rehearsed for 30 minutes, you know, and, and he said, okay, go pack your bags. We're leaving at eight in the morning, you know, I said, okay. So, so the whole thing was kind of like a movie. I wish it was a camera following us around because everything was just kind of, you know, it was, it was like somebody writing this somewhere, you know, because you know? he didn't tell us anything about the gig at all. Nothing. You know, we, we, uh, you know, we were there for a few days, you know, and uh, I think they, uh, one of the hotels, that, the hotel we were supposed to stay in, you know, it wasn't quite ready yet. It was a brand new hotel, so they put us at the Hilton for that night. And then after we left the Hilton, I think it got bombed. You know, like the, the lobby was good. You know, right after we left, you know, it was like, well, that was special. You know, <laughs> so we got the other hotel. And then we run into this guy Bunker Spreckles, who was the heir of Spreckles Sugar. You know, and and uh, you know Lonnie knew him. You know, Lonnie Turner knew him, and he was there with some playmate girl, hot looking. You know. And, and they, they were like, well, you know, come on, let's let's do some shopping, you know, that kind of thing. And so we did that, but but you know, Miller wouldn't tell us anything about it. We went down and picked out some amps to use, and then the day of the show, it was like, uh, you know, they picked us up in a limo and we're going down through London, and, and like Doug and Lonnie and I are in the back because Miller's in the front. He's not telling us anything. It's like, what do you think we're playing? Maybe a maybe a bar mitzvah or something? Maybe a, a wedding? You know, what are we doing here? And, and then we pull up to a hotel and it's like, ah, oh, it's, it's got to be a wedding or a bar mitzvah. So we, we get, in the, get in the elevator and we go up to the roof and there's a helicopter waiting for us. And we're going, it's not a bar mitzvah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so now it's like the Peter Pan ride at Disney. Now we're all squashed into a little helicopter and we're flying over London. You know, it's like, oh, look down there. It's like, you know, the House of Parliament. You know? <laughs> and we're flying out and then. It was like uh, about 30 miles north of uh, London. It was like these nice rolling green hills, you know, like kind of like in, you know, like Monty P Arthur days, you know, <laughs> the castles and all that. What? What? Is someone in the castle we can speak with? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we'd start, you know, and keep going. And all of a sudden it was just like rolling hills of people, you know. Like, My God, we rehearsed 30 minutes for this. <laughs> and it, it ends up we're. We're uh, the second bill of Pink Floyd, you know, <laughs> and, and we're doing the, the second net worth. And, he, and Miller purposely didn't tell us anything about it. 300,000 people. Yeah. What's it like to walk out on stage and see that? Terrifying. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you, you know, <laughs> what key were we in on this song? <laughs> you know, it's like, geez, I, you know, I wish I had more time. I would have made notes. <laughs> yeah. What is your perfect size audience to perform to, thinking? 300,000 down. You know, it doesn't matter. It, 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 what, what really matters the most is, is if they're into your plan. You know, it's, it could be 10 people or 10,000 people, whatever. It's, 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 the, it's how the, the audience reacts to you is, is, is what, for me, is, is, is the great part. I mean, if, if it's, if it's 300,000 people sitting there looking at you like, you know, it doesn't matter, does it? You know, right. but if they're like, whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa, yeah. And it's like, you know, a, a small crowd and then, then uh, you know. Making a connection with it's the connection. It's the connection with the audience, you know, that really makes them, that's That's my favorite audience. Your latest work, Delta Breeze. Delta Breeze. Where'd you draw upon inspiration for, for this one? Well, you know, I've, uh, uh, I came back from L.A. after my, my dad passed away and my mom was hanging out by herself. And so I just kind of hung out with her and I hadn't, hadn't had a chance to hang out for a long time. 
because I was out out in California doing a lot of stuff. So, so I just uh, I set up a little eight track studio, and I just started you know writing stuff, you know, and I wanted it to be simple. I, I really uh, I wanted to get away from all the big production and all that, and just do it kind of like a cream album, you know, like where it's just very homegrown, just guitar, bass, drums, and vocals, and, and just good tunes with good harmonies, you know. And that's that's what I came up with. I mean, it, uh, you know, I, I even I, I called up Mike Finnegan. I said, Mike, I said, you know, like, uh, <clears throat> you know, I want to send you my new CD. I mean, you're gonna notice there's no keyboards on it because, because well, you know, I figured if I couldn't have Mike Finnegan on it, I just won't have any keyboards on it. But but really, I just didn't want any any, any more stuff on it. I just want to keep it real basic, real guitar, uh, vocal oriented, and just good tunes. And, and well, I understand that these songs are connected. There's meaning behind each one that made it onto the album? I, I, if you look at my stuff, there's always some meaning in there. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I take a lot of time with my lyric and stuff, you know. Sometimes I'll have a double meaning in, in things, you know. And, and uh, yeah, I just, you know, it's, it's, you have to make it interesting that way if, if, you, if it's going to be simplistic, I think, you know. You have to, have to tell some kind of story. And I, I mean, I just, it, it's like writing a short story when you're writing, you know, when you're writing songs. And you got some of the messages in, in, the, in the songs that are on this Delta Breeze album. You got Time Will Tell. Some would probably not even argue the fact that morality straight across the world is dropped. Is this something that you've noticed in that? Is what uh, Mama oh, yeah. song? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I could get deep with you on this. But I mean, I don't think humanity's really evolved into anything more than what it used to be. I mean, when people want to take away our guns and everything, uh, I plead the Samuel Colt, you know, the peacemaker. It's like, it sort of levels the playing field, you know what I'm saying? Sure. And, and I just, I don't know, I mean, th there's a lot of different ways you can look at that, but, but the bottom line is, is, you know, we all have our own God-given right to be able to protect ourselves. And, and I, don't, I just don't think humanity is really going to ever change in, in the... the the way that uh, you know they people deal with each other. I, I think there's always going to be criminals. There's always going to be people that are that are going to abide by the laws. And so, what do you do? You know, to, to level the playing field. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's it's unfortunate that that some things happen. Uh, you know, especially uh, you know when when uh, you know somebody goes on a shooting spree or something like that, or somebody blows up something or whatever. I mean, it's 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 that's the fanatics. You know, and, and uh, I think those are the people who need to go to jail. I don't think I don't think the rest of us should be punished for that, for somebody else's stupidity. You, know? uh, you can certainly try to avoid it the best you can, but you know, like uh, I'm one of the types that I would rather have a gun and not need it than uh, need it and not have it. <laughs> you know. How about your tribute to the bikers, wide open in the in the wind? I am a biker. Yeah, I've yeah. always been. A, I've always been biker trash. You know, I'm a, I'm a two-wheeling biker bum, you know. And Do you ride even while you're on tour? No, no, I, I try to tone that down. I did that uh, with the, the Stevie Nicks tour. We, uh, Mark Andy's from Heart. Yeah. Uh, and had a few really nice Harleys, and he let me borrow one. And we uh, we were rehearsing for the Stevie Nicks tour. The, it was, ironically enough, it was called the Whole Lot of Trouble Tour. And that's what it was, too. Uh, I, uh, I got in a bike wreck on that one. Somebody pulled out in front of me, and I had to lay it down. But, but uh, what are you gonna do? Right. Keep on going. Last song on the album. These are the good old days. Are these, these the good old these days? These are the good old yeah. days. Yeah. Explain to me why these are the good old days. Well, it's just because you know, uh, actually that that was inspired not by the Carly Simon song, but but uh, an ex cop friend of mine. I, and I hang out with lots of cops. I mean, I, I ride with a lot of a lot of retired police officers and. And this one, uh, his name was Pooh Bear, you know, that's his nickname handle. And, uh, you know, we're always saying, you know, like when we, you know, we pull up to a place and we get a couple of social waters, you know, and it's like, you know, these are the good old days right now because, you know, we're all up in our 60s and everything. And, and so uh, it's just that simple. These are the good old days because we ain't getting any younger, you know. So as long as we can still ride and still function, these are the good old days. You know? How many guitars do you own? Uh, probably not enough, but uh, what happened was, is uh, you know, I, 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 I was finished buying guitars. You know, I, I got, to, I had a lot of vintage guitars, you know, and they got stolen in uh, the late 70s, so I just, 
you know, I just really kind of lost interest in buying anything else. But but now I'm starting to get back to buying some more stuff and, and getting some. Uh, the ones I play now are like custom made, so they're 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 not on the off the rack. They're they're stuff that I have made and and you know it's. Uh, Do you have a favorite? Uh, I got I, well, I got these two straps that I had made. I, I had the wood made from Warmoth. And then I, I endorse all the components, you know, which is uh, EMGs and the Kaler tail pieces and the Schuyler pegs and all, all the good, you know, stuff. And I had a guy named Billy Fells assemble them for me. And I call them mom and dad because both my mom and dad are past, you know. So, so it's my way of bringing mom and dad on the road with me. And and uh, also, uh, you know, they're they're just they're they're designed to, to every bit of the specs or what I've always wanted a Strat to be like, so so I had them made the way I wanted to have them made. Out of all the, the blues out there, Dixie Blues, Chicago Blues, what do you think the next hybrid of blues is going to be? I just think it'll always be what it is, blues, you know. <laughs> and, you know, blues is blues, and, and uh, you know, I know that there is there is some, some difference, but, you know, I, I, it's, it's like it's like the my album, the Delta Breeze. I mean, what, what I mean by that is, is there's just a lot of flavors of, of music and sound. You know, so it's, to me it's just a Delta Breeze, man. It's just, there's a lot of flavors and a lot, a lot of different uh, blues that, that happen in the South, all the way up to Chicago too, because Chicago's got a lot of good blues. Anything that you'd like to tell the people watching today? I don't know, <laughs> stay healthy, stay in school. Give the kids some, some good advice. Oh, well, <laughs> don't learn how to play guitar, man. <laughs> Stay away from it. Uh, go to college, man. Learn to trade. You know? Is it possible to play music and make it work for you without going to college these days, or do you think that's just two things that have to go together? I think, I think that, you know, especially because of the way that, you know, the record companies and the fact there are no more record stores or, you know, I mean, uh, if, if somebody really wants to be in the music business, you uh, you almost have to have a business degree in college, to, and uh, and something to, to do with advertising, you know, to, to really, uh, and you know, of course, you have to have talent, you know, first, you know, but uh, you really almost have to do it all these days, you know. You have to, you have to, and, and it's nice to have somebody help you. You know, I have this uh, girl that used to work with uh, Universal that I finally met. She's been helping me yeah. lately. And we're we're both trying to figure it out together, you know, and try to figure out. Well, what what do we really need to do? And her name is Sherry Peck too. I know she loves it when I mention her name. You know, but uh, uh, you know, we're just trying to figure out, you know, how to to, to break it to where, you know, you you, you kind of use the same uh, philosophy as, as uh, the record companies used to use in in promoting an act, but the the avenues of uh, being able to do it are different. The playing field's different. You know, it used to be you could use radio to bust your new record. You know. Right. And, and you could plaster your stuff all over the record stores, you know, and, and show your new latest and greatest release, you know, well, that's just not there anymore. So, you know, uh, I was uh, finally talked into doing Facebook, which I just can't stand, you know. It's, uh, you know, I did MySpace, and, and that sort of fell along the wayside, and everybody went to Facebook. So, But I guess it does have its advantages, you know. So, so you just sort of use every kind of outlet you can, you know let people know that you're out there and, and what you're doing. Delta Breeze. Go get it. Les Dudek. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Bob. All right.